Hi there, my name is William Fettis, and I'll be presenting sparsity in NLP along with Barrett Zoff. Uh, this is a, a really new, exciting area. So sparsity is sort of accelerated scale, and we think this should be in more and more applied models. We'll be presenting on our work um, previously done at Google. So scale has driven significant progress in deep learning, and in particular, natural language processing. In 2020, Kaplan et al. found the neural scaling laws. They found that the language modeling performance actually, when not bounded by the model capacity, the amount of data, or the compute, demonstrates a power law scaling over many orders of magnitude. This has led to extremely predictable performance for language models and has sort of permitted the industry to scale up at a, re a relatively reduced risk. Interestingly, these models, the larger models have other benefits as well. So larger models require fewer samples to reach the same performance. And with the compute budget, the optimal model size actually grows smoothly. However, these models can be extremely expensive and sparsity is one of the um, most promising areas for increasing the scale without increasing the cost. But first, what are sparse expert models? In effect, a sparse expert model is a neural network that uses only a subset of the parameters for each example. So typically, a neural net is going to use every parameter for every example. Instead, a sparse expert model chooses which parameter for each example. And this has sort of included a lot of common variants, um, some more familiar, such as like mixture of experts. This is the most common, uh, and it's a 30-year-old concept. Uh, more recent work from switch transformers, routing networks, base layers, hash layers, and effectively, all of these things have this like same commonality that you're only using a subset of the parameters and therefore it's compute efficient. In the transformer, this has sort of become uh, the de facto language modeling approach. And we have self-attention, add normalize, and we have feed forward blocks interspersed. These feed forward blocks are what is often turned to a sparse layer uh, for these new modern models. So what we're doing here is we're visualizing two tokens, the dog, flowing through a transformer. On the left-hand side, the dense model uses the same feed-forward network, FFN, for each token, and then proceeds with the computation. However, for a sparse model, you have a selection. So the token is being selected, uh, the token the is being selected to feed-forward network two, and the token dog is being selected to feed-forward network n at uh, one. These are very large models, but they actually have the same computational cost uh, as the dense model. We're gonna quickly just summarize some of the math behind it, but it's, it's very simple. Effectively, what you're doing is you're looking at the token representation and you're compu computing a probability distribution or a gating network over the available experts. The scores are just simply from a softmax distribution. So an input comes in and you establish a probability distribution over the available experts. You send that token to the top rated experts. So top K is the most common approach. And then you weight that the probability of being sent there by the expert probability, uh, by the expert output. And again, so mixture of experts and transformers are simply taking this feed forward layer and substituting it. So you often see this with like a mixture of experts. So you can really think of mixture of experts as a layer uh, inside these uh, bigger uh, neural networks. And the benefits of sparse expert models has been very um, widespread. First of all, um, the scaling properties are really tremendous. So Switch Transformer and Clark et al. in 2022 showed uh, significant gains of the validation loss, a measure of like the held out performance of the model versus the expert count. So on the far left for both of these plots, this corresponds to a standard dense transformer. And in both cases, as the expert count is increased from two all the way up to 512 on the right plot, you see very consistent monotonic improvements with the model on the, this held out performance. This translates into faster pre-training and, and speed savings. Second, uh, in, the fine tuning is um, dramatically improved. So currently a sparse expert model holds um, many NLP benchmarks state of the arts. And this is interesting because it actually outperforms larger um, dense variants such as Palm while using only 1 20th of the compute. 
In addition, there's also been a, a large amount of performance, particularly from Glam, Do It All in 2022, showing better zero and few shot performance. Uh, here we show the uh, sparse model in the yellow curve outperforming on accuracy for flops per token over many different model sizes. This is also corroborated in another work, which is uh, sort of a collaborative effort with the community called Big Bench. And again, found that sparse models on few shot inference were outperforming over a set of uh, 160 community contributed tasks. And finally, another interesting finding is sparse expert models seem to know when they don't know better than a, a dense model. Uh, so what we're showing here is the calibration measured by the expected calibration error. Uh, basically, it's a measure of what that the likelihood of the prediction matches the likelihood of being correct. And it's hard to tease out from all the different lines, but the sparse models here are presented in dotted lines and the dense models in de uh, solid lines. And you see significant gains uh, showing that a sparse model is actually calibrated as a 10x larger dense model. However, all these gains are not without some difficulties. The first two um, we'd like to highlight are first model instabilities. Um, this means basically that the training loss can become divergent after some period of training, and this can be often more unstable than standard dense transformers. Second, while the best models do, uh, while the best uh, fine-tuned models are sparse right now, um, sometimes there is a gap between what performance you would expect. So on the plot on the right, we're showing the negative log perplexity. So this is a measure of the upstream performance of the model. And on the y-axis, we're showing a superglue score, a downstream performance. And interestingly, like in these scatter plots, we'll often find that for a given perplexity, a dense model will often outperform a sparse model. However, a sparse model often is just starting at a better perplexity, so it, it often does better anyways. Uh, but we've made some big improvements, so I'd like to hand it to Barrett to talk about these. Yeah, so there's been a lot of really great work recently um, trying to like you know improve and build upon sparse models, including fixing a lot of the you know uh, some of the issues that they have. Next slide. So one big improvement was actually the uh, router Z loss. So the idea was that, you know, like previously Liam showed that sparse models tend to be more unstable, you know, especially as they are made larger and larger, their loss, you know, tends to sometimes diverge and you can run into a lot of like, uh, you know, instability issues. A lot of this actually came down to um, numerical issues and one really effective approach um, for handling this is the uh, router Z loss. So with this, the idea is like you're just basically constraining a uh, certain act like the, the logits going into the router function to be smaller, which allows for better uh, stability. Next slide. Another, uh, so a lot of other improvements have actually gone into the fine tuning of sparse models. So in the previous plot uh, that Liam was talking about where on the you know, X axis and Y axis, you have the like pre-training and uh, fine tuning performance and there's discrepancy between sparse and dense models. So one way that this can actually be um, remedied is actually through just like better uh, hyperparameter selection for sparse models during fine tuning. Basically, if you're using bad fine tuning hyperparameters, they can mask any of the pre-training improvements of sparsity. Below, we study uh, two different key hyperparameters. Uh, one is batch size, the other is learning rate. And we can see that for sparse models, the smallest batch size is preferred during fine tuning. And for uh, dense models, the largest batch size is preferred for fine tuning. And we notice a similar trend for the learning rate where spar the sparse models prefer the largest learning rate and the dense models prefer the smallest learning rate. And actually this is very much in line with the hypothesis that since sparse models have many more parameters, they are more likely to overfit and using both a small batch size and a larger learning rate are known to be uh, very good regularizers. Next slide. Yeah, and so also, there's been a lot of work into like figuring out the right way to design sparse models because you know if you want to use a sparse model one there's the question of like you know how many sparse layers do you want to use how many experts do you want to use how frequently do you want to use the sparse expert layers and then also like how many like flops per token should be used uh, next so here we can see uh two switch models designed off of the p5 uh, dense encoder decoder models and so we can see two very different types of models here. One is switch XXL, where it has um, significantly more flops per uh, sequence, but has a lot less experts than switch C. So switch C has you know, 1.6 trillion parameters, switch XXL only has 400 billion parameters, 
but um, you know, they're very different uh, types of model trade-offs between flops and parameters. And actually in practice, we found that um, switch XXL fine tunes significantly better while switch C uh, gets better uh, pre-training complexity on, in terms of the like, you know, compute quality Pareto curve. Next. The next two models are from our recent work where we tried to take the insights of both where we had um, significantly larger flops. So you can see that the flops per sequence is the largest out of any of those models while having a um, moderate a moderate amount of number of experts. And this was the model that actually uh, still currently achieves state-of-the-art fine-tuning on many different um, performance and quality benchmarks. Next slide. So one nice thing about sparse expert models is that they are in some ways more interpretable than a standard dense model. And this is because you know, during training, there are actual discrete choices that need to be made when uh, training the model. So when each token goes to each expert layer, you know, it only will be getting sent to some discrete number of experts which then makes it easy to study for each token, which experts is it getting sent to. And this allows for some level of it, uh, interpretability for us to kind of go in and inspect how the experts are specializing, what tokens are getting sent where. Next slide. So, yeah. And, you know, a big, um, yeah. So a, a big area of research with sparse models is actually the uh, routing algorithms, which you know, is determining the process I previously mentioned, where you basically given the token, you have to determine uh, where, what expert the, the token is actually going to go to. Um, so next we're going to actually talk about like a few of the uh, most popular uh, routing algorithms. And the idea is that for each diagram, there'll be two tokens going into the expert and you can kind of see some visualization for how these two tokens are routed. Next slide. So this is top one routing, which is you know the simplest form of routing where simply you have the token come in, there's some learned router matrix, and then you send it to the uh, top one expert that has the highest uh, router score then the output is multiplied by the router score in order to make sure that the whole process is differentiable. Top two routing is exactly what you might expect, which is where now instead of uh, each token getting sent to the top one expert, it's sent to the top two experts. Next slide. Yeah, another int really interesting form of, uh, of a routing algorithm is a hash routing, where instead of having a learned routing mechanism, you simply have a hash function that takes in the token, you hash it based on you know, the, uh, like the string and you send it to the expert that corresponds to that hash. And this is kind of a very interesting proof of concept that these kind of uh, routing algorithms can work at all because it's not learned at all and it still achieves a pretty good performance. So there's still a lot of open questions to what exactly the routing algorithms are doing in terms of the uh, like algorithms. Next. Next is another uh, formulation that's kind of the opposite of you know, uh, top one and top two routing. So instead of a token choosing the top one or two experts to be sent to, now the expert, each expert chooses its top K tokens it wants to be sent to it. And this has some interesting dynamics. So for one, uh, each you know, expert can choose the same token. So like this allows for some level of um, you know, certain tokens can get a lot more compute than others. And in practice, this routing algorithm seems to perform quite well. Next slide. Yeah. That now there's other routing algorithms that actually look at things in like a global sense. So the previous routing algorithms typically looked at things in a local sense in terms of like each token will independently make decisions or each expert will independently make decisions. And what these, what base routing and a few other routing algorithms like it do is you look at the whole um, matrix of, you know, token by um, expert scores. And the idea is that based on this whole like global matrix, you're making like the most informed routing decision as possible. And in practice, this works pretty well, although it does have a little bit more communication cost. Next slide. Yeah, and then there's also using reinforcement learning for token routing. And the idea being that, you know, we have the uh, log probability of each uh, token prediction. And so we can use this actually as like a reward signal for determining how well the um, expert uh, routing decision was. Next slide. Yeah, and like I also mentioned before, uh, yeah, sparse expert models also have this natural, uh, with like, you know, extra layer of interpretability that dense layers don't have. And, and now we are going to actually go through and kind of look at some of these uh, routing decisions that are being made uh, token by token. Next slide. So yeah, how are, token route, how are tokens routed? So here we can see that we're going to pass in uh, two tokens to each expert layer, more parameters as an example. So we can see, you know, more parameters get sent in and like we mentioned before, they go through the routing algorithm and then they select the top uh, one expert. 
And what we're going to do in this example is send in, you know, different tokens and then trace what experts they're going to and record it and see if we can see, you know, interesting semantic groupings. Next slide. Yeah, so in this, we first study uh, masked language modeling and then we're kind of studying how tokens are being routed. And so here we can see that actually, you know, in mass language modeling, you know, like span corruption, there's these um, masking tokens, which has been noted by like extra ID. And we can do see that like these special tokens do get sent to certain experts. So some, there's some specialization there. Next slide. We can also see certain experts specializing on punctuation, conjunctions, and articles. Next slide. Yeah. We also see some verbs and visual descriptions. Next slide. And also proper names, counting and numbers. So yeah, when you do have learned routing algorithms, the model does seem to specialize, even if it's in, you know, uh, some shallower uh, categories. Next slide. We can also look at this uh, in computer vision where now sparse expert models are being used and are, are uh, very successful. So here we can see um, some, uh, like how uh, image patches in like a VIT model are routed in a mixture of expert models. And we can see that, you know, there's an expert that will specialize in plants, eyes, wheels, so forth, so on. So it is cool to see even across modalities that these experts are specializing in some semantically meaningful way. Next slide. Yeah, next slide. Yeah, and so, you know, just with the final note, we wanted to talk about two uh, future directions that we're both uh, very excited about. One is adaptive computation. So sparsity at a high level, the idea is different inputs get different subsets of parameters by having them go to different expert layers. And with adaptive computation, different inputs can get different parameters and different amounts of computation. And we think that this is like a very promising future direction that is very additive with current sparse methods. Another thing we're really interested in is how sparsity uh, interplays with retrieval methods. So sparse models and retrieval have very overlapping goals. The idea is to increase the capacity of the model to better store, retrieve, and apply knowledge. But you know, it's still very open questions on how to best combine and get the best of both worlds with both of these methods. Next slide. Yeah, so to conclude, Sparse expert models have really surged in popularity over these last two years. Um, sparsity offers really significant quality boosts uh, with reduced computation. You know, for a fixed amount of GPU hours to spend, sparsity will typically get you the best quality. And many uh, famous benchmarks are currently held by sparse models. And we think sparsity is just, you know, a stepping stone into uh, having fully adaptive models. Thank you.